Okay. Okay. It is Wednesday afternoon, July third. Happy Fourth, everybody. Thank the Lord for our country, and we will pick up on the greater place that we're looking for, who the greater city whose builder or maker was God, because that's where we are. Coming back in Revelation twenty-one, we are looking at the new Jerusalem that's coming out of heaven. And if you think anything is glorious here. Well, I think by the end of class, I'll take taking care of that for you, <laughs> because the glories there cannot be compared. We've already looked at that, that how it, it's new, there's a new heavens and a new earth. We know that this new Jerusalem is not the Jerusalem, Jerusalem that's in Israel on earth. We know this is the one that comes down out of heaven. We have seen it in a, a small description already. I won't go back over that, because we're going to see it in a greater description uh, in great detail as we move on. It is the home base for the overcomer. We saw the overcomers when overcomes by his faith. So that's, that's where it is our home. That's where our citizenship is. We saw that we inherit along with Messiah that we are uh, in the family. We are sons and sons is a relationship that's forever. It doesn't stop once a son, always a son, no matter what you do, good, bad, or indifferent, you're still the son. And of course, that's son slash daughter. You know, that's not meaning just you men. We saw in verse 8 that those who are not in are the cowardly. Cowardly or fearful. And I don't know if I covered it well last week, but if you're walking in fear, that's the opposite of faith. That if we have faith, we do not have fear. We said last week, feed your faith, and your fears will starve to death. And we know that Hebrews 11, 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So those who are in fear are not in faith. They're not one with God. They're not adopted sons of God, that small s, I mean. And so this is not their eternal home. They are out on the outside. We also saw that the unbelieving are not there. Of course not. They are very much faithless. And that it takes faith, it takes believing in not only just who Jesus is, but in accepting him as Savior. The demons know who he is. It's what we do with him, bringing him into our hearts, bringing him into <coughs> our lives as Lord and as Savior. We saw the abominable are left out. Abominable is a word that means polluted. We know that abomination in Scripture is idolatry. So those who are worshiping false gods, those who are involved in idolatry, those who are involved in staking worship, those are the ones that are not in this new city. They're not the citizens of the city, and we wouldn't want them to be because there's no company. Light doesn't walk with darkness. We saw, uh, and I believe I gave the scriptures last week, but in case if I didn't, we uh, know it talks about the abomination of desolation. In Matthew 24, <laughs> and uh, Matthew 24, 15, and we know that we also saw it in Daniel 9, and we know that we can take it all the way back to uh, Deuteronomy, Dabarim, <coughs> chapter 7, <coughs> verses 25 and 26, tells us that abomination is idolatry, idol worship. So in case if I didn't say the references before, I've given them to you now. We see that sorcerers are not in the new city. Sorcerers are those involved in the occult. The cult is satanic worship. If they're wanting to worship Satan, then they can stay and live with him in the lake of fire forever. They have no place in our heaven. And lastly, but most importantly, and I, I don't know that it really is above all the others, but in my mind right now, in a sense, it is liars. Why would I say that that's all the way up at the top? Because what started all of this was a lie. And I think that's why lying is a pet peeve of God's. We see on his list, when he says there's seven things he hates, lying is in that list. It's the top of that list. And I think that's why. And how wonderful, how reassuring to us to know no lie will enter in. It will not start again. It will not repeat itself. Heaven is not going to become earth one day. Hallelujah. <laughs> no fears, no worries. It is not. Remember we saw last week also that God would wipe away all that puts tears in our eyes. He not only wipes the tears from our eyes, but he wipes away those things that cause those tears. 
He wipes away death. He wipes away mourning. But he also wipes away lying. Because lying is that breach that breaks that trust that can never be brought back. Lying is what devastated the first Adam. And it took the second Adam coming and conquering to buy back for us by his shed blood what was to be ours from the beginning, what God had wanted for his creation. Uh, in case if we didn't look at it, and I don't think we did because we hurried in the end, let's go to 1 John real quickly. It's not hard for you to find because it's just barely in front of Revelation. 1 John chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 22. Uh, Roger, can we get just a little bit of air and not freeze mm -hmm. everybody out, but a little? First John 2, 22 says, Who is the liar but the one who denies that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Christ, the Messiah? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. So what we see is, in essence, because it is the spirit of Antichrist, because he's putting himself up that he's God, and he's lying and denying who God really is and who is God, that he's also, besides God the Father, he is also God the Son. It is denying that sonship is equality with God the Father. It's wanting to usurp that position that belongs to Yeshua Jesus and to him only. So anything short of that is a lie, and it's anathema. It's so horrible, it's anathema. And that's exactly what Stephon did and who he was. He wanted that position, and he tried to usurp it. And unfortunately, he still brings it on to others, <coughs> and they swallow the lie that he puts out, again, by virtue of a lie, and they will miss eternity with our Father in Heaven and with Yeshua and Lord Jesus because of the lie. So it is. It's something absolutely horrible. Chapter 5 of First Yohanan. Let's start with verse 10. Chapter 5, <laughs> verses 10 through 13. The one who believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. And remember we saw that the Antichrist and the dragon who was um, uh, indwelling the Antichrist at this point went after those who had the testimony of Yeshua and uh, what was the second, the testimony and the, just escaped my mind. Um, oh my goodness, it'll come back to me in a minute. But anyway, the, the testimony is the one I'm hitting on because of these verses here. The testimony that God has given concerning his son. So let me reread the, the verse. I think I skipped some. The one who believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar. Can you imagine getting in God's face and saying you are a liar? But that's basically what they're doing and what Satan has done. Because he's not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And this, that testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life. This life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. It's that simple. You want eternal life with God? It comes through the son. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. That's the opposite of truth, life. Way, truth, life. It just all comes together. Now, these things I've mentioned, the cowardly or fearful, unbelieving, abominable, sorcerers, and liars, and yes, bless you, <laughs> these are principal characteristics of the unsaved. We'll find that across the board in the unsaved, and that we will find it leads to the worship of Satan, because he is the father of all lies, he is the one who sows discord, who causes them to not believe, who leads them into the cult, all of this, it, it just all follows him. So now going back to Revelation, I think we've covered that well now, and back to Revelation 21, and starting in verse 9 for today, and we read, and by the way, just to finish our thought, verse 8 told us that sorcerers, idolaters, liars, abominable, murderers, all these that we've just taken apart, their part will be in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We know what that is. We know that those of us who are saved never <coughs> take part in that second death, never stand in judgment, and never go into the second death, which leads into the lake of fire, which no one ever comes out of. That's where they will spend eternity. Sadly, but they are the ones who have separated themselves from the love of God. 
when he has left for those who love him. Now in verse 9, we have then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plates came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Okay, let's go back and let's divide this up and see what we've got. But I want you to get that whole thought of what's happening because this is exciting again. This is on the move again. First of all, we start with that first phrase. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls. That we identify with, if you remember, Revelation 16, when the bowls were being poured out, the seven bowls, and they were in very quick succession. They were the last. You had um, the other, the seals and the... Um, <coughs> trumpets thank you the seals and the trumpets first and now the bowls and by the time you got to that seventh bowl we knew we were dealing with armageddon we knew we were dealing with the right at the very end of the tribulation period so why are we being taken back to that why are we remembering that and it makes it clear pull the seven last plagues that came or, or this angel came and spoke with me why this angel probably i think it's because God is showing us the extreme contrast between the two. We had those plagues. We had the judgment of God in all its fullness now. Not holding anything back. That cup had been full. It had been poured out. And it is the complete wrath of God fallen. As we follow in that succession, we came to chapter 17. We came to the false uh, Babylon. Or, or Babylon's not false, but I mean the false religion. We came to Babylon, we came to a, a city that we're going to see in contrast to this city. We're going to see that this city is a holy city. That city, do you remember what it was full of? Abominations, remember? Idolatries, all the false worshiping, all of that was in there. So I think God is using the same angel to bring to Yohanan to show him the great contrast between the two. But I also see, once again, it seems like every time God shows and tells about his hard hand of judgment, which is deserved, he also shows us that side of mercy that's there for those who will receive it. That God never just lashes out in judgment, but what comes is what is deserved could have been spared had they chosen his mercy. So they have no one to blame but themselves, really. Um, when Yochanan sees Babylon in chapter 17, the great harlot, and he sees her judgment, he's going to see that all implode. Um, but we see, again, we see that was the headquarters of the Antichrist, the one who rose up the most in the face of God, the one who took in onto himself because Satan was indwelling him, worship me. If you don't worship me, you don't take my mark and worship me, you're dead. Well, we see the battle, do we not? We see the, the contrast. We see the harlot in chapter 17. And what did we just read here that we're going to see it this call? The bride. The bride. Good. I, show, I will show you the bride. Wow, what a contrast. A harlot or a bride? <coughs> By the way, both were splendidly dressed. We saw that. Remember the harlot? She was in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls. We'll wait and see about the bride, the adornment of the bride. So it's not that those things are bad as what they're represented, because what it represented for her was sin and its filthiness, and what it's going to represent here is a far different contrast. Um, you want a bride that's utterly pure and beautiful, but you don't want a bride that's just beautiful on the outside, do you? You want a bride that's pure on the inside. Well, that's what we see in the New Yerushalayim, is the beauty on the inside. And we'll talk about that, who's inside that city. But the inside of the harlot, oh, that was all that uh, uh, abomination, just absolutely abomination. Okay, so we have um, the seven angels, one of the seven angels had the seven bowls of the plagues, said, come here, I will show you the bride. Okay, well, you hear that. And you're going to picture in your mind, as soon as I say bride, everybody pictures a gal, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not what Yochanan's going to see. He's going to see a city. Well, why is he calling a 
city a bride. Um, in the Oriental customs, which this was called the area of the Orient back in Bible times, in Oriental customs, it was um, uh, the ruler. I was trying to think who he's called. Okay, I'm just going to call him a ruler. A ruler of a city, it was said as if the city was married to that ruler. Well, the Lord is our ruler, and our city is married to him. Because who's in our city? The church. Who, who is the church? The bride of Messiah. So you see why the reference is given. It not only fits the oriental custom of the time, that, that the city was um, like a bride married to her husband, but we also see it in the example that the Lord gave us. And we'll look at references for that very shortly. I'm just giving you a little overall until we start breaking some more down. That the city is the bride's home. It is the bride's headquarters. Philippians 3.20. Let's go there real quick. Philippians 3.20. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, and I read, But we are citizens of heaven, and it is from there we expect a deliverer, the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. He is our deliverer, and I love that we're citizens of heaven. Remember, we contrasted that when we were all the way back in Revelation chapter 3. When we were in chapters 2 and 3, we were in the seven churches, and we remember we saw the time um, periods of the church history but we also know that that it was examples of the churches and we look for that both ways in today when we came to the philadelphia church we saw that is the period of today that's the church that's on fire for the lord that's sending out missionaries that loves the lord that's keeping his word in obedience we saw it contrast with the way of the sea which was was more like babylon things are beautiful on the outside but they're full of filthiness on the inside. She thinks she's clothed well, she's naked. She thinks she's seen well, she's blind, etc., etc., etc. But remember the Philadelphia church, what was promised in chapter 3 and verse 10? It was promised that because of their faithfulness, that they would be kept from the hour of temptation. And remember, we, we went long and hard into the depth of the hour of temptation is a tribulation that would take place on the face of the Whole earth, and it says in 310 that it would come on the earth dwellers. Do you remember that? The earth dwellers. Well, are we earth dwellers? No. No. We're citizens of heaven. We right now are ambassadors. That's what Paul calls us. We are ambassadors. What's an ambassador do? Leaves the home city, goes to another country, and um, What's the word he does? He, he represents. Thank you. He represents the the head of his home. We are to be representing the Lord to the world that is not citizens of heaven, and we encourage them, draw them to the knowledge so that they will want to come to know it experientially through the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. So, to me, it's very exciting to see this is our home. There is no doubt, this is our home. How many of you have a vacation home? You love your vacation home, it's great. You get to go away, you get to leave all your problems, you get to have fun. But how long does it last? <laughs> and it's perfect when you get there. <laughs> it, it, it just can't compare. And when we get to this description, oh my goodness, there is nothing on earth that compares. This way. Right. And that's for us forever. Remember that word last week, forever. <laughs> so, um, and again, it's interesting to note that the angel that had to deal with God's wrath and judgment, it gets to be the angel that deals with God's blessing. Mm -hmm. I think that's sweet also, that since the angel had to be involved in that judgment, let the angel be blessed be involved in the blessing here also. Um, and it encourages us too. So with that in mind, we're going to see in the rest of this, um, the bride, we've said, the wife of the lamb, and we know the lamb from Revelation 5. We know who the lamb is. We know the lamb was slain, but is risen, is now like the lion of, of Judah, the lion of Judah. But this angel is the one, because the, he goes back to the angel. One of the seven angels, da da da, said, come here, or, or come go with me, however your says it. So we know it's the angel that's, that's talking. 
And so when Yohanan John says, and he carried me away in the spirit, it's the angel. The angel carried him away in the spirit. This is the fourth time in the book of Revelation that we are reminded that Yohanan was in the spirit. Okay, chapter 1. When Yohanan saw the Lord. Mm. Remember that beautiful description, God the Father, God the Son, <laughs> both intertwined where it's very hard to tell the difference. You see them both in their fullness and in their glory and their titles and, and with the throne in view there. Well, we saw that the Lord told Yohanan in chapter 1. He, he was caught up in the spirit, but the Lord told him in chapter 1 to write. So he's writing in the spirit. In chapter 4, when Yohanan was invited up to the throne room, which we've gotten a few glimpses of, he got to actually see. Mm -hmm. Now, I got to wonder, what was it like to come out of there and back down there? <laughs> Depressing. <laughs> Very. <laughs> Very. Because the little glimpses we get make us so excited, we can hardly wait. And I can't imagine being in it, seeing it, feeling it, experiencing it, and then being told, uh, go back. <laughs> wow. Yochanan, you needed some help from the Lord, I think. Chapter 17, the angel took him. Here's our comparison again. The angel's taking him in 21 to see the new Jewish line. But the angel took Yochanan in chapter 17 into the wilderness to show him Babylon. Okay? We'll talk about that more in just a bit also. And in chapter 21 here, here's our fourth time when the angel carried him to a high mountain. Okay, so my point in this, all the way through this book, we have Yochanan's eyewitness experiences. Not imagination, not what did he eat the night before, not what hallucinogenic drug was he on. No, God took him up in the spirit and he was shown what was reality, what is, excuse me, not was, what is reality. This is fact. This is not imagination. I stress that time and time and time again. And now we're going to see that he got to actually see his eternal home, ours yet to be. And uh, we see it uh, again. We're going to see the co contrast between the harlot and the bride, between chapter 17, Babylon, the, the city of that God, I'll put it that way, the little G, and we're going to see the city of our God. The great big G. Well, often in scripture, wilderness is not a good place. Mm -hmm. Wilderness is a place of testing. It's a place of evil. It's also the desert. We know the children of Israel wandered in the desert for their unfaithfulness, for their unbelieving. We know that uh, many times, remember when we were reading what happens to Babylon and how it becomes like a wilderness and that only the jackals and the owls and that sort of, and, and some of the demons that are kept trapped would, would exist in Babylon. And Babylon would no longer be a place inhabiting people. That often, all the way through, we'll see when um, the Lord even was tempted, he got up from, they call that a mountain too, but it was in a wilderness area. Okay, but um, again, just know that wilderness is often a place of testing or the place of evil, representing evil where the mountain frequently is the place where God reveals himself. Very frequently we see that. We see it in Mount Horeb, we see it in Mount Sinai, we see it in the Mount of Transfiguration. If you don't know all these times, I'll go into the, an explanation later, but let me just take you to a couple rather than all of them for the sake of time. Mount Sinai, I think you're all more familiar with. Mount Sinai is where God gave the children of Israel the law where he came into a covenant with his people in a very special way. Remember, Moshe went up in the mountain, the Shekinah glory filled the area, and he was in the cloud. We talked about that last week, dwelling with the Lord, that intimate, the, as if he had pitched his tent there, as if he, this had become a, his place of abode. And who was aboding, or I'm going to say, who was he aboding with? God himself, who then spoke to Moshe and gave him the law. The Mount of Transfiguration gives us the coming glory of Yeshua, that he was seen in all his glory by the, the few talented that had the opportunity to see. They got a sneak peek. Remember Moshe and Eliyahu, Elijah, were there with them. And they knew who they were. How did they know that? How many years prior had Moshe and Eliyahu, Elijah, lived before the Talmudim, 
that were with Yeshua Jesus. Hundreds of years. Way back then. I'm trying to think. Moshe, he brought them out of Egypt about 1445 B.C. So we're going to say at least 1,000 years for these two, okay? Because I know Eliyahu is before David, and David is, is uh, around 1,000. So at least that long. But they instantly knew. And by the way, that answers the question for all those who say, well, are we going to know people in heaven? <laughs> well, number one, why would you know less in heaven than you do down here? Okay. <laughs> Here's the prime example from scripture, because let scripture be your answer. Not my words, not my thoughts, not my imagination. Let scripture be your answer. So here they saw them. They saw them in, in well, they saw the Lord in his glorified state, and that was up on a mountain. We know the Lord went up into the mountain to be a part with the Father, to pray all night. If he knew that, how much more do we need that? Let me now take you very quickly to Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 40. And let's see what happened with this prophet, Ezekiel chapter 40. And we're going to look at verse 2, I believe it is. Yeah, 1 and 2. We'll look at 1 and 2. Okay, and remember the order of um, Ezekiel 37, dry bones, Israel back in the land without the spirit. 38, 39, battle of Armageddon. The Lord returns by the time you get to the end of 39. The world will know who he is. The only time the world will know who he is is when he has stopped the battle and set up his kingdom. So we know that's the time it's talked about. Then Ezekiel 40 starts the measuring of this temple, Ezekiel's temple. They call it the third temple, but really they've got to call it a fourth temple because there is a third one during the tribulation that I think will very much suffer destruction during the tribulation also, whether it does or doesn't at the return of the Lord with the Mount of Olives cleaving in two and the whole valley changing shape, and I believe opening it up to make the, the temple big enough for all the people who are going to need to come through. Now you have a glorious temple, and this is the temple that uh, um, is described as having the glory of the Lord go through it. You don't read that for the tribulation temple. You read it for Hezekiel's. So in chapter 40 and verse 1 and 2, we have in the 25th year of our exile, at the beginning of the year on the 10th of the month, in the 14th year, after the city was taken on that same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me there. So Hezekiah was taken by the hand of the Lord. In the visions of God, he brought me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. And then it goes on, on, um, on it to the south. There was a structure like a city. So he was given a vision that sounds very similar, saw a city. He was taken up on a high mountain, and it was by God or by the Spirit of God that he finds himself being able to do so. So uh, obviously, we're not looking at um, an earthly city. We're looking at something heavenly on this high mountain in the Spirit taken by the Lord. So we have similar language here. I think they were seeing much of the same thing. And he described the temple like a city. And then we have a description here of the temple, the glorious temple during the millennial time. But even though we're going to see some, some comparisons, we have to go beyond the temple that's on earth. We have to go beyond what the millennial temple and millennial earth was like, because the new is greater than that in every way. And we will see that, we'll go into that. Um, so the city, the new Yerushalayim, um, in back in, I guess we're going back to Revelation 21.10. Get there real quick. Revelation 21 and picking up in verse 10. We're, we're seeing now the holy city because we understand the, the great mountain. By the way, mountain, um, we do see God's government, God's in control. Um, remember when the <coughs> image was struck by the stone that grew up like a great mountain, and we know the stone that was cut out without hands spoke of the virgin birth of the Lord. It was the Lord crushing the earthly kingdoms, and then his kingdom filled the whole earth. We know that was a picture of the millennium, but carried on even greater because he is king of kings, lord of lords, and here is his great city, what we're reading here now. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> the, the New Jerusalem, also called the bride, by the way, um, I'm sorry, let me put it a different way. Okay, the city, the new Jerusalem that we see here in verse 10. Look real quick at chapter 19. 
verse 6. Keep verse 10 in mind. And look at 19 and verse 6. It wasn't that long ago we were there. We read, Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And we're over here now in 21 reading about the bride, right? So now we're tying in the two. And we know that this bride in verse 7, was, or verse 8, I'm sorry, was given to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. The fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Remember we're told that the Lord puts his robe of righteousness on us? That's uh, how we are righteous, because our righteousness is as filthy rags. But his righteousness clothes, and his righteousness makes us righteous. And we see that we are his bride. We see a, a clear description here of us. We know this is what we call the church today. We know this is us. And, and furthermore, when we come down in, in chapter 19, we have... The armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Does that not just describe us? So even though we're described as a bride, we're also described as an army. We're clothed in that fine linen, clean and white, following him who following the Lord on white horses. We know that, that we come back out of heaven when he comes to stop the battle of Armageddon. We are with him. But we are his bride. We've made ourselves ready. How did we make ourselves ready? We, we were washed in the blood of the Lamb. He's really the one who made us ready. But now we're ready to be received in to have that marriage supper, to have the feast that, that follows, we know. Some believe, and you can go either way, <coughs> the feast was during the millennium, some put it at this point. Either way, it does not matter. We know that we are married to the Lord, and we have the feast, and the marriage goes on forever, and he takes the bride, as was the oriental custom, to his home. He's taken us to his home forever, and we are now going to see, as we go back into 21, our eternal city. So let's go back to 21, and let's go back to verse 10, I think we're in, yes. And let's see our <coughs> eternal city, okay? Um, let's take a sneak peek at verse 14. The wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay, when we read that there's a wall, we're beginning to see how we're talking about a city, because we know there are walls in our city, don't we? So it's just giving us an idea that we're not just talking about an analogy that's, that's way out there. We're going to see city. We're going to see city structure. And so just giving you a little sneak preview, let's go back <coughs> to verse 10, and we're going to, to um, we're going to get our description. Okay, so show me the holy city coming down out of heaven from God. Um, why do I have it's holy? Did I miss the holy city? I missed the word holy. How can I miss holy? <laughs> Again, our contrast. Remember Babylon? Unholy. Nothing holy to say about Babylon. Here's our contrast. It's a holy city. That's also why I know it's not the earthly Jerusalem because as much as I love the earthly Jerusalem and as much as it will be better in the millennium, it's still not called a holy city, okay, because there's still going to be sin there. Remember in the millennium, they can still sin. They can still rebel. Many don't openly, but they do in their hearts, and it shows at the end of that time. So it's still tainted with sin. That's the past, remember? Everything's been wiped away. That brings tears and death. Wages of sin is death. If there's no death, there's no sin. It's been done away with. Hallelujah. We're in a holy city. We're looking at a holy city and we see that it descended out of heaven remember that again told us it's not new remember we have new heavens and new earth but we don't have a new it, although it's called the new Jerusalem, just in contrast to the earthly not meaning that it just got created no in fact even we know during the millennium it hovered over the earth now that earth is gone we're seeing again that, that this new jerusalem comes out of heaven it is suspended basically in space look at verse 24 the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. So we've got nations around it. We've got um, whether it be the kings of the earth. We've got an earth. So remember, it was a new heavens and a new earth. It's not that there's no more heaven or earth. It's a new heavens. It's a new earth. And we've got the new Jerusalem 
As far as I'm concerned, to my knowledge, that's the only thing that continued from what was millennial. The new Jewish line that hovered over the millennial earth is what's carried on, is what I'm saying, okay? It, it didn't just get created fresh and new. Remember when we looked at those words for the new heavens and the new earth? That's not the same here, okay? So, um, we have it sheltering, we have it suspended in space. Uh, very interesting, it's going to be light to the nations. If they're going to bring their glory into it, we'll talk about what that means when we get down there. But let's look at that idea of what it's doing when it's, it's hovering over. Um, let me just take you, it's easier than trying to say. Go to Yeshaya, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 2. Whoops, whoops, I gotta think which, which uh, version I'm in. <laughs> okay, Isaiah or Yeshaya chapter 2, verses 5. Well, we'll start with just verse 5. And in verse 5, we have um, the Lord speaking. He says, Come, house of Jacob, house of Jacob. Now, remember, Jacob was the one of the two twins that loved the Lord, was interested in the spiritual, received the birthright, is the one to carry on. The promises were made to Abraham, to Yitzhak, to Jacob, to his uh, progeny. Okay, this is the one. He is calling the house of Jacob. It's a, another name that you could say for Israel. When Israel's in her spiritual state. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. So Israel's going to walk in the light of the Lord. <coughs> okay, now look at verse, chapter 4. Same book, chapter 4. Thank you. And chapter 4 and verse 6. And chapter 4 and verse 6 we read, There will be a shelter given to shade from the heat by day and refuge and protection from the storm and the rain. Okay, now we know, especially during the millennial, there had to be this. So I'm sure that this is speaking more millennial, because if you look at the whole description, you've got, in that day, the branch of the Lord um, will be beautiful and glorious, the fruit of the earth will be the pride and adornment of the survivors of Israel. This is language that makes us know they're talking about the millennium. But we get the idea of, of what's carrying forth. The idea is that there was a shelter that gave shade from the heat by day, protection from storm and rain. Well, remember, they're going to walk in the light of it. So in some way, the nations are going to experience the light. I'm going to say our new Jerusalem <coughs> is like their sun. That it's going to give them light. Holy light. <laughs> A little timing off, Tony. <laughs> That's the blowing of the shofar and kids. That's why I said it. Um, the word shelter, when it says that it'll be a shelter to give shade, is the Hebrew word sukkah. And if you've been with me when we built the sukkah, that gives you a good idea. It, yes, like a mini one, it, it had that opening to remind them of God who was above it, how God provided for them, provided all they needed to bring them through those years in the wilderness. And then remember when I talked about how that intimacy when he was in the cloud, the Shekhinah cloud, and we saw when we talked about the clouds from the Jewish perspective, when you get into the depth of the Hebrew, there is something in there that begins to bring down to the level of an intimate dwelling together, a tabernacling. It's almost, not quite, but it's almost like the mother bird over her nest and how they're under the wings of protection very close in the Hebrew terminology to that analogy. So you can go you can go there. It may not match up perfectly, but you certainly are not climbing out on a weak limb to, to bring that whole picture together. So this is a beautiful picture. Even those who are in the nations, and we'll talk about who they are as we come to them, are going to experience the light and the glory of the Lord, of God himself. So verse 11, going back to Revelation, Chapter 21, Revelation, there we go. Revelation 21, and back to verse 11. <laughs> okay, so the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. So it's a part of heaven. It's not all of heaven. It's coming down out of heaven. And it has the glory of God. Verse 11, having the glory of God. Um, before I read the next sentence, catch the, what's being said here. The city has the character of God himself. 
it really actually, in some way, I don't know how to say it, it is God. It is. Now, how do you how do you make them a city? You can't. You, the same way, though, we, we battle, how do you understand the triunity? How do we see the separateness of the three, and yet the one? Well, in this sense, we see this is God. It is His glory. It is Him. It is so splendid, it's going to defy description. Yet, Yochanan Troy. And we'll get a good idea. But I have a feeling we're going to say, he didn't get near, but how could he? Well, I think we'll honestly say he did the best a human could with human resources at hand to describe something. But it's like a blind person trying to describe the, a, a candle. You, if you try to describe that candle to a blind person, you tell them, oh, well, the flame is orange and it's blue. Well, they've never seen color. That doesn't do any good. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's fat. Well, they've never seen fat to know fat versus thin. They might have felt something to know what, okay, fat's bigger, but that's all. How do you describe heaven with earthly terminology? Mm -hmm. It's not going to get there. But we get an inkling. We get enough to excite us, don't we? And what is the glory of God? It says it has the glory of God. What does scripture tell us the glory of God is? Romeo, it's got it. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Let's hit that first and then we're going back. I don't think that's on your papers, but you have to go there because it's... What was that? Hebrews. Hebrews 1, yes. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. If I can get my, my um, notebook here to let me in. Okay, there we go. Hebrews chapter 1, because I think it's really one of the best descriptions out of all the scriptures. <coughs> it says so much, it's so happy. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers, how did he speak to the fathers? He spoke to them in the prophets. He spoke to them in many portions, many portions of scriptures. He spoke to them in many ways, verbally, written, in nature. In, in the testimony of others, spoke in many ways in the last days, and we're in those last days still, but the last days were at this point also, because remember with God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. In the last days, he's spoken to us. Do you catch that personal lines? Us. Now, granted, this book was written to the Jewish people. It was written to the people called the Hebrews. These were Hebrew Christians. These were those who had come to believe. They had faith in the Lord. They had believed that he was the sacrificed lamb. It's very close after that time, just maybe 30, 40 years around there. No, 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 I'm sorry. No, 20 years, more like about 20 years since the Messiah had sacrificed and risen from the dead. They had been going along fine. The Jewish temple had accepted them as another sect, S-E-C-T, another sect. You had Pharisees, Sadducees, you had the Gnostics, you had, uh, I can't think who, but you had your groups. They accepted the Hebrew Christians as a, another group. The way. They called them the way. Very good. That was how that terminology began. They were of the way. And we yeah. know who the way was. So it was following Yeshua Jesus. Would that be considered a denomination or like today? Since you've ever broken off in so many. I hate to call it a denomination because that gives a, a negative connotation. Um, followers of, of Jesus. Uh, followers, followers of Jesus. Of Jesus. It, it's, I, I'm going to say the way is up here and then denominations came off of that. Mm -hmm. Because the way really to me is Yeshua Jesus himself. Uh -huh. And I, I can't, I can't right, split right. it. So I, I can see where you're thinking and it's a, it's a fine line there. So either way, yeah. but but I'm I'm going to say I'll be or no. And all that, Those were like denominations. Like, yeah, yes. they're trying to say that they're was part of them. Right. Like trapping them in, kind of. Right. 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 Okay, okay. And and initially they were all there. Today we have Orthodox Judaism, Conservative Judaism, Reform Judaism, Reconstructionist Judaism. We have different branches. They, they had their different branches and they just allowed Hebrew Christians in there. The Hebrew Christians still went to the temple. They still did the, the prayers. They, they, they were keeping part in the feasts. What they were not doing was the sacrifices because yeah. they 
had their sacrifice now, so they're not participating in that. And as that becomes evident and they're telling people they don't have to make the sacrifices, whoa, wait a minute, I'm a Pharisee, I'm a Sadducee, I'm of these other sex, S-E-C-T-S, I have to make sure that I'm not in right. <laughs> so I don't get myself in trouble with my immortality versus immorality. <laughs> Those of you who weren't here, that's an inside joke. <laughs> they suddenly had a problem. Wait a minute, you're telling people you don't have to do that? We don't want you in our temple. And they basically have kicked them out now. Well, these Hebrew Christians didn't have the privilege of what we have. All of these scriptures, all of these studies, all of these people to teach and to educate and to know and to, to be able to, to go to a source when you have a question. Remember, Shaul Paul is just writing the books to the churches that we take and glean so much from. He was educating and helping as much as he could. And he wrote to the Hebrews because he realized they had a problem. You see, they wanted to be very good Jewish boys and girls. And if you were a good Jewish boy and girl, and you loved the God, the one true and living God, the God of Israel, then you are obedient to his commandments. You are obedient to what thus said the Lord do. So God had told them that if they were out of the commonwealth of Israel, they would miss out on the blessings. Well, as long as they were continuing to go to the temple, they felt they were still a part of the commonwealth. And in essence, they were the commonwealth is sharing. It'd be like a kibbutz, you know, they're all one. But now they've been kicked out and they're out here on the outside and they think that they've done right. But hey, if the Lord comes back to Israel, he comes back to his temple, he comes back to his people and we're out here, maybe we're gonna miss out on those blessings. Maybe <coughs> we didn't get it quite right. And now their boat's rocking. And I use that analogy because that's where Shaul Paul comes in and says, don't drift past the safe harbor of your salvation. What's your safe harbor of salvation? Yeshua. He makes it very clear through the whole book of Hebrews, everything about Yeshua was better. The better life, the better peace, the better sacrifice, the better house, the better promises, the better everything. I don't, whatever you see a description of in Hebrews, it's a comparison between what Judaism was and the better end Messiah. So he's telling them, no worries. You haven't missed out. You are in the right place. You're going to receive the greatest blessings from the Lord. You are one with him. You are his son. You are all part of his commonwealth. And so that's what Hebrews was written for, was to encourage those Hebrew Christians then. It encourages this Hebrew Christian today because I'm not in temple. I'm not keeping all of those ritual, the sacrifices and things. I couldn't do that. Can I do the prayers? Sure, I can do the prayers. I choose to do prayers from my heart instead. But you can do. There are parts that you can do. There are parts you definitely can't do. But also, this isn't limited because remember, God spoke to Israel to take it to the nations. So when it's saying that, it, that he had spoken the last days to us, yes, he spoke to the, the people of Israel because that was his channel. They were to be the priests to the rest of the world. So it's for you also. So he spoke to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things. And last week, remember, we found out we're joint heirs with the Messiah. So what he gets, we get. Ooh. We get the new Yerushalayim. We get the heavens. We get the glory of God forever. Never to be out of it. You get a taste today, a little glimpse, and I'm sure you've all had those spiritual highlights as have I. You don't want to come out of it. You don't want it to end. You want to be in it forever. One day we will. He has spoken to us and has said, Whom he pointed out of all things, through whom also he made the world. Leaves nothing to be questioned. The one who created this world is also the one who it all comes to. We know that's Yeshua himself. We know also God created. But here we go, because we're talking about the Son. The Son, the one he appointed heir, the one who created the world, he, verse 3, is the radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. Wow. The express, uh, what's it say, express 
exact, exact express image. I guess I've got my King James and my New American mixed up in my mind. Whatever you have there, the radiance of his glory, the exact representation, that is the glory of God. That is the Shekhinah glory. When you read it, the Shekhinah glory, and this is what you're reading. That glory, that's what it is. And that glory is what is what lights up the whole new Yerushalayim. Is there night in the new Yerushalayim? No. no. How do you turn out God? <laughs> he can't. He can't pull a chain and the light goes out. You can't. There is no night there. The Shekinah glory is the light. Let's go back to Revelation 21 with that in mind. And Revelation 21, we're back in verse 11, but take a sneak peek with me again. I would love to do that. Go down to verse 23 this time. The city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God, the Shekhinah glory, has illumined it. And its lamp is the Lamb. Don't you love it? Mm -hmm. I just see this, this glow that we know Moshe could only see what was left behind. And even that made his face so brilliant, they shadowed that. Wow. Wow, what glory. That's the light of it. It gives the appearance of a sparkling jewel. Have you ever seen a diamond held up to the light? Mm -hmm. And you see the sparkle and the color and the brilliance <coughs> and the glory and the beauty? Well, hang on, because here we go. Okay, we are going to look at, let's see, i got to go back to where we were. We were in verse 11. It has the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. Now again, when it says stone, think the word jewel. Don't think of a hard rock, you know, rough rock. That's not what we're talking about. This is something very sparkly. In scripture, jasper speaks of light. We know we're talking about the light, so that fits perfectly. But again, I don't want you to say it because I said it. I want you to say it the word of God. So if you don't remember, and I don't think many of us do, all the way back in chapter four, Oh, there we go. I got a temperamental notebook today. Chapter 4 and verse 2. The end of verse 2, but we'll probably start in verse 2. In chapter 4, remember, Yochanan has just had his second time when he's in the spirit. He's been called up to see what's going to take place hereafter. The door of heaven opens up. We know that he is seeing in heaven. And he sees immediately in the spirit a throne with standing in heaven and one sitting on the throne right there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, but how's that throne, or how's that one described who's sitting on the throne? Verse 3, he was sitting, he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. There was a rainbow about the throne like an emerald in appearance, okay? And it, and it goes on. I don't think we need to read past that. But God who is light, God who is this brightness, we are seeing here because we know it's God sitting on the throne. And in that we see he's like a jasper stone. That's that brilliant. We're going to see that really jasper, the scripture time was um, opaque. It was not something that you'd see through. But in our vernacular, I think that what it was referring to is what we today call the diamond. So I think if we were writing it today, we would call it a diamond rather than a jasper. Don't we know God, when he spoke of the jasper, he was speaking of light. It's just our jasper isn't light today. Our jasper is dark, okay? But here is the jasper of God's um, throne and the sardius. The, the jasper is, is like the color, like the diamond that reflects. But the sardius is red. Okay, and of course I see right away in the red the shed blood of Yeshua, Jesus, for us. But, um, and then the rainbow around the, the throne it has all the shades of green. And have you ever thought of rainbows that are all one color, but all the different colors of that one color? I mean, don't limit God. Don't limit God. He is amazing. So, the new rich lamb is reflecting all that God is. All the glory. God, all of the, the perfection of God. What words do I say? Words don't, don't get there, and we're just beginning. Keep going on this journey with me. 
This is an adventure, remember? We're, and we're, unfortunately, we're not caught up in the spirit. Lord, I'll take it. <laughs> so, unless I get caught up, I can't do even as good as John, but I'm going to try to help you understand John. So how do I get that the crystal is, or the jasper is clear? Because of our next, where'd it go? Oh, okay. Okay, because of our next phrase in here. Um, having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone as a stone of crystal clear jasper. That's why I say, see, for scripture, the jasper was crystal clear. The jasper's like our diamond. It's not me saying it, it's scripture saying it. Now, clear as crystal means it's transparent. It's shining as crystal. The Greek word, here, Roger. Air, please. <laughs> they, they want to know they're in heaven. <laughs> okay, the Greek word for the source of light is what we see here. And when Yeshua declared, I am the light of the world, we can use these interchangeably. This is what he is describing, okay? Um, and I think what Yochanan John is trying to describe is the beauty of the stone rather than specific characteristics. Now he's just trying to describe the beauty of it. Just this gorgeous, wow, light that, that the closest we can get is to look at a diamond. Okay, now, if you've got transparent gold, and we know that, that we do, we know the streets, and we'll talk about that more, but if you've got transparent gold, and you've got a diamond, do you see an engagement ring? Mm -hmm. Remember what the spirit is for us? Our engagement ring, as good as our wedding ring, the diamond in gold setting. Mm -hmm. That's our exhibit. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I've only just begun. Mm -hmm. And we can't imagine it. No. But try. Let your mind go. If I can get far enough and I want to, so I'm going to watch my mouthiness. There's something I want to read to you about the time you think that you've let your mind go and you're beginning to see something greater. I'm going to blow you all so far out of the water you didn't realize you ain't got me anywhere yet. Because <laughs> it's what God's done. Okay, so this city, this, this beautiful diamond, dazzling diamond set in gold, it had a great and a high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and the names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. Let's take that apart. Wall. A wall will speak of exclusion. A wall excludes someone. It's separation. But a wall is also security, is it not? It is strength. It is safety. For those who are in the city, that's what it is. It does exclude those we talked about, the liars, the sorcerers, the abominations. They're excluded out. But inside the wall, we feel nothing but security strength and see this beauty and only those who are qualified can enter and we know who the qualified are <coughs> but what's the wall made of and what, what's the purpose for the wall well maybe just to as i've said just to give us that sense of belonging security, security. security. it's strength and it's excluding maybe even excluding us from what evil from, we've got the like a fire the out there. Was gone. Well, it, it's, it's it's gone in the sense it's not free roaming, but the lake of fire that burns forever that contains Satan, the false prophet, the the Antichrist, and all those who died without Yeshua, they are all there, and maybe it's showing them what they're excluded from, because if we see it transparent, we see it open. It's not that they can't see. Although I'm sure we're not looking at hell when we're in there. There's no way. There's absolutely no way. But it, but it would be just an exclusion, but, but or more than that. Exclusive. If you like it that way, there you go. It's an exclusive city. That's a good way to put it. The palace is exclusively belonging to the queen, and only the queen gets to go to certain areas of the palace. You go to Monaco. Monaco, they have their areas. I'll show them. They'll let tourists in all over, but you don't see where they really live. You don't see their little palace. <laughs> you just see from the outside. Um, so we know we've got a wall, though, because it tells us that. It has a great and a high wall. I want to know what that wall is made out of. Hmm. The I think scripture told us? Yes. Sneak peek, verse 18. Uh, <laughs> the material of the wall was jasper. jasper. 
and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. Do we see again that diamond ring in the gold setting? Is it not gorgeous? Now, are you seeing walls that are not ugly cement? Are you seeing something beautiful, sparkling, shining, reflecting the glory of the Lord? And under you, you're seeing transparent gold? Oh, this is sparkly. Wow. Okay. Well, let's keep going. Let's go back up to verse uh, 12. For sure. We have our great wall. Yes, ma'am. Question. At this point in time, have all of the <clears throat> the people that are that have passed and they're waiting for judgment, have they all been judgment has been and gone. judgment? So it's all it's all out here. The great white throne judgment was right here where people of all time, from the very first one who died without Messiah, all the way through time, has now stood at the great white throne, stood before their judgment for the degree of suffering, so to speak, that they're going to face, so that someone like a Hitler suffers more greatly than a sweet little old lady who never hurt anybody and tried to live a good life. God in his fairness <clears throat> will mete out judgment equal to what they have done. Okay. At, at this point in time, was that wall there and, and the people that had not yet been um, faced their judgment, they, they, could they see that wall this on the outside? Time, I don't believe so because believe that's been in, in heaven. Remember, it's in heaven that it's that come oh, out. Okay. okay? And these have been in the heart of the earth in the suffering side we never see it taken out of the heart of the earth until it comes up to the great white throne judgment when they're standing before god at great white throne judgment the heavens and the earth flee when that judgment is set up remember it's as if he's he sets up a, a station in space which you know we understand from what our astronauts do today but this is even more glorious because it's god doing it not man but we know God can, can take gravity and throw it out the window and they can stand in space. And it's basically what he does, but there's not a window for him to throw it out of. But you understand what I'm saying. So the, the heavens and the earth have fled away. The heaven, the, the scroll, it has curled up. It has, it, it's, we saw it at the end of the tribulation how the stars were falling, how it was all crumbling. We see it rolling up because the scroll has been completed. The story has been finished. And I believe that God rolls out, if he does it in the same manner, a new map, a new heavens, a new earth. I, like I said, it's not that there's no heaven and no earth anymore. No, we just read about nations and people, so we know that there is, and we know that these earthly people that lived during the millennium that did not rebel are going to continue on living. We talked about that last week or two weeks ago also, that we never read about them getting a resurrected body. And we know that Adam and Eve, God had intended for them to live forever in that state. And not in the state of sin, but you know, prior to their sin. He, the, the sentence of death came in because of their sin. But in actuality, thank God, it did come in that they didn't live forever in that state. Can you imagine us living like this forever? I mean, that would be worse than the death sentence in my mind. So God in his mercy did not allow that. But they have come up now here. You've got the heavens and earth have fled away. The new Jerusalem that hovered over the millennial earth, I think must have gone back into heaven during this time because we read here in 21, it came down out of heaven again. So I think that I think it's, it's movable. It was once, why not twice? So we come into the part that we call eternity future, where we don't know, we only have just the bare sketch of the beginning. We have no clue what goes on past there. But here is where we're talking. We're all the way over here. So all of death, all of sin, all of unsaved, all of that has been dealt with, and that has been done, and it's it's gone. For us, never be remembered. We're not, I, I guarantee you, you're not going to go look over the pit of hell and see people suffering in hell. There's no way. That's not heaven. That's not, you know, our eternal home. So, and can they see the eternal city from where they are? I don't think so, because that would be seeing something that would tell them what the presence of God was like, because they would see the glory of it. And they're, they're, they've taken themselves away from everything God is, from light, from love, from perfection. 
So I don't think they even say it. Now, when we get there, we'll find out whether I'm right or not, because scripture doesn't tell us on that. So I won't be dogmatic and say it, and if you want to see it a little differently, that's fine. You're entitled to use the mind God gave you. Remember, I always tell you, don't check it at the door. Bring it right on in. Let's talk, let's, let's think, let's question. But in my mind, it's bad enough they're in hell, in torture, in torment. Forever. Now, what just popped in my mind when it was both were in the, the heart of the earth, paradise, and the suffering side, they could see. They saw the gulf in between, and they could see. Because remember the rich man said, sin Lazarus over. Let him just, you know, t touch his finger of water to the tip of my tongue. Maybe they can see, and that's part of their torment. That could have been theirs. I don't know. I don't ever want to know, really. So... Back under our beautiful, we're into the 12 gates now, because that's what comes next. We have got our great wall. Our wall, it, we're saying it excludes, and we're saying it's exclusive. Well, you've got to be able to come in. We're not going to climb over the wall every time we want in. <laughs> so there happen to be 12 gates to come in. Okay, in Scripture, 12 is the number of administrative completeness. So God is always complete in what he does in his administration. This is his complete administration, and that's what 12 represents. Um, it's also the number for Israel's government, because remember, God is going to be ruling for Israel. God will be Israel's government. At the gates, okay, we have, um, we have with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels. That's like each gate would have... And here again, we're just trying to understand, but maybe like a, a tower. Um, you know, when you drive into some of those parks, there's there's the gatekeeper. <laughs> I picture it kind of like that, only this is the one who's going to check and see if your name's written, whether you get let in or not. But at the gate is like an honor guard. It's a watchman. For whatever reason, there are these angels at these gates, maybe just assuring us Nothing's going to sneak out. Nothing's going to penetrate. Nothing's going to come at you. I think I read someplace that the, the gate, the 12 gates, was never closed. They We're coming to that. We're coming to that. Is it in this verse? No, it's not, but it's coming. It's coming. Where is it? I'm looking for it real quick. It is there. I totally agree with you that the gates are always open. Yes. Uh, 25? Uh, 25? Thank you. Thank 25. you. I knew I'd studied it. <laughs> yes, his gates will never be closed. There you are. Right on target, the end of verse 25. Yes, so even though there's a, a, an honor guard, an honor angel there, for whatever reason, maybe even just to welcome us in. Yes, yes, maybe so. We like to have people welcome people in. If we do that, where do we get that idea? Maybe God or Eric. Yeah, I'm kind of question I was always going to ask, maybe you can answer. Okay, the 12 gates that the apostles are at, was the 12th one to be Paul? <laughs> or do okay, we not know it? That will take us off into a whole other conversation. Okay. So I will come back to that. I'll give you both sides of it, but I won't do it in the middle of the city. Okay, so okay, I'm, I'm sorry. That's yeah, so okay. But, what but he's asking is, is the 12th apostle Paul? Because we know the 12th included Judas, Judas, and we know that he he yeah. um, betrayed I'm sorry. I'm sorry. our Lord. And they, the, when the eleven were together, they needed another one. They brought in Matthias, um, and there's an argument whether he is or whether Shaul Paul is the one who's the twelfth. So I can I can give you scriptures on that, and I can go on okay, with you. Cool. But, uh, but there are two schools of thought, both have good points in them. Okay. We'll find out one day. Okay. So the gate, though, if we compare what we know of gates on earth, the gate is a place of government or a place of judgment. But instead of it being judgment in the sense of negativity here, this would be where righteousness is dwelling, the righteous judges here. So this is righteousness at the gates, that as you enter in, you're entering in into the righteousness of the Lord. Everything is just and fair and right. It's not that it has to be decided. It's not that they're getting heads together and, and having a government meeting. No, it would be righteousness that is being represented here. And that's why we would call those 12 angels, because it does tell us 
that there are 12 angels at the gates. That the best we can call them is honor guards. But the honor guards have a great position when they're marching. You know, they have a great position. The honor guard is honored. So, you know, we see this as honorable. Okay, I think we've done all we can with that. So we go on and the names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. I think that's pretty clear, <laughs> okay? The names of the 12 tribes, here, let me break this down. I don't wanna, uh, okay, the gates of, and the names are written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes. Okay, we're gonna take that first phrase. The 12 tribes of the sons of Israel, so, each, each gate, we've got one of the names of the 12 tribes. They were of Israel. Now we know that God judges the rest of the world through Israel during the millennial time. And again, that's during the millennium when the city is hovering over and the government authority is on the throne on earth that Yeshua is sitting on in Jerusalem. So that's what we see like when you read Matthew 19, 28. Um, or Luke 22, 28 to 30. Maybe we'll go ahead, I think we can do it quick and just so that there isn't confusion because a lot of times you have to read the, the whole section to find out whether you're talking about millennial or whether you're talking about eternity after. And that's what I want to point out. I'm going to Luke 22, verse 28. We'll go there first. Um, it says, you are those who stood by me in my trials. Yeshua is speaking. You stood by me in my trials. Just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, we know God granted the Lord kingdom on earth, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's yeah. what he said to his town would be, to his 12 disciples that, that were with him. That's millennial. We see that very clearly because they're sitting on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel down here on earth at that time. At the time of the millennium, I mean. Okay? He's promising them, you, 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 you're, you're going to prove your faithfulness to me and you're going to be rewarded. Remember, ruling and reigning is a reward. It's a reward we can gain or we can lose. If we are not faithful to him, we lose our reigning. We don't lose our salvation. We lose reward. We lose reigning with him. So here he's saying how they would rule and reign with him, but that's talking millennial here on earth. Matthew 19. Matthew 19, and we're looking at verse 28. Matthew 19, 28 says, And Yeshua said to them, Truly I say to you that you have followed me in the regeneration, the renewing, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, millennia, you also will sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So I believe his Talmudim are going to be judging Israel specifically. And they're going to be others judging other areas. But that all is very clearly um, millennial time. Okay? Now, go with me to Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 48. Remember I told you he gave the description of the uh, millennial temple. Ezekiel, all the chapters 40 through 48 are on that. We're going all the way to the end of it, 48, verse 31, almost to the end of the chapter. And we have it, the description shall be the gates of the city, named for the 12 tribes of Israel, three gates toward the north, the gate of Reuben, the gate of Judah, the gate of Levi, and then it goes on and tells on the east, Yosef, Benjamin, Dan, or Don, on the south side, Three gates, Simeon or Shimon, Issachar, Zebulun on the east side, the gates of God, Asher, Asher, Naphtali, I skipped one, and the, oh, God, Gath is how you say it. G A D is God in um, Hebrew, but not, not R G O D. So I'll say Gath so you don't get confused, okay? So we see 12 earthly names, the earthly tribes that are around the earthly millennial. But what do we know about the tabernacle when Moshe made the tabernacle? Did he just create, oh, I, I went to architecture school and I drew out and I knew exactly how to, to you know, I just created this fantasy. No, no, patterns, pattern after what was in heaven. So again, what I think we see on the millennial, the gates and the 12 tribes and the names around them, take it now to the heavenly level. I think that we're seeing that's where it came from, the pattern 
on earth after the heavenly. So, again, to know what we're talking about, we'll read the whole section and you'll know whether you're talking millennial or whether you're talking new Yerushalayim, heaven, hereafter, which really is exclusively in chapter 21, maybe in the 22. Okay, so, and I see God's order. You know, he just he does everything in order. Now, we've talked clearly about the fact that what's called the church, the called out assembly at this time, is the bride of Messiah. But also remember that the um, what we call, and I like the word better, original testament, you call Old Testament. Um, and I say that because we don't want to think of old as antiquated and done away with and replaced because it's not. It's the foundation brought into and fulfilled in the new, often concealed in the old and revealed in the new. We know it's the bud, the bud of Judaism gives to the flower of Christianity. You take away the bud, you never get your flower. Mm -hmm. You've got to see that the two in Judeo Christianity goes together. Mm -hmm. So we also want to see that the Old Testament saints are part of this too. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews. <coughs> Okay, come on. There we go. Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 22. We'll start there. Hebrews 12, 22. Now, remember, Yohanan was taken up to a high mountain to see this beautiful picture? Well, it's interesting because in verse 22 it says, But you've come to Mount Zion, Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Yerushalayim to a myriad of angels. Now, does that sound like the description of the earthly Jerusalem? No, no. Here how the terminology is very different. We've been brought up to the city of the living God. When we see a high mountain, we're seeing what God did with this representative chest of God. The heavenly Jerusalem right there tells you we're not talking earthly. Myriad of angels. Okay, so we've got angels in our new city to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. That's the, the what we call the called out assembly, the general assembly, the called out believers, the, the what we call the church in quotes today. Sometimes that's a safe word, sometimes it's not, but I'm trying to be clear how I'm saying it. The firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Who was the, the who ranked in priority? First risen was as if he was the firstborn of God. Remember, that didn't mean God gave birth. It meant rank of position. But as he was raised in a resurrected body first, he was first fruits. We were the following. We are the rest of that. So the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, that's us. Your name is on that roll in heaven. And to God, God is there, the judge of all. And to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. To Yeshua, the mediator of the, the new heaven. Okay, it goes on and on. So we see there's a whole more, whole lot more than just us. We're there, but there's others who are there with us. Okay, now, well, let me take you. I don't remember what it says, but I've got it in my notes. Go to, to chapter 11. Back up just one chapter. 11 and verse 10. 11 is the chapter of faith. I love it. Yes, okay. Oh, yes. In fact, go to verse 8 first. Go to eight. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. God boomed his voice out of heaven, hit Abraham, and said, Go. Did he say, Go to North Carolina? <laughs> Go to Tucson? <laughs> Go to. Um, what can I say? Go to Italy? <laughs> go to Spain? He didn't even tell him where, did he? He told him to go. That's faith. When you step out without a roadmap, that's faith. What does God want of us? How many times is he asking you to step out in faith? Trust me. Trust me. And I guarantee you, every time you step out in faith, your foot's going to land on the solid rock. It's not going to crash, it's not going to burn, it's not going to free fall. Even the little birds that are kicked out of the nest, mom comes down and swoops under and brings them up if they need it till they're ready to fly. But don't be afraid to step out in faith. 
God rewarded Abraham for that faith. Remember, he's in a family of idol worshipers, in a city of idol worshipers, in a land of idol worshipers. This is the total change when he says that he was a Hebrew. He was the first to cross over. Yes, he crossed over the river, but that's just the earthly meaning, the better and bigger meaning of that crossing over is he left behind all idolatry. He heard the voice of the one true and living God. Did he ever hear a voice of another God? No, no, unless Tom made it sound like voice because he is who heads all of those gods, but he's not equal to God. But Abraham <coughs> was able to discern that this was the one true and living God. God gave him that faith to believe and he moved in that faith. He stepped out in faith and he was rewarded. He was going out to a place that he was told, I'm gonna give you a huge land. I'm gonna give you an inheritance that's gonna be for you for your son, for your grandson, and for all the sons that come after that. We know that literally is a land called Israel in its entirety, not in its small little form today. But he didn't know where he was going. He just had to follow how God said. By faith, he lived as an alien. He, he, lived, he lived in tents. He didn't ever settle down and build a city. The whole time he was in the land of promise that was in Israel, in a foreign land, because it was foreign to him from his beginning, he dwelt in tents with his son and his grandson, with Yitzhak and with Yaakov, Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of that same promise, the promise that God gave to Abraham. Why didn't he build a city? Because God told him, you're going to a new city. You're going to a heavenly city. You're going to live and belong and be the citizen of the new Yerushalayim. How do I get that? Verse 10. For he, Abraham, from verse 8, Abraham was looking for the city which has foundations. Okay, this is a real city. If you lay down a foundation to build something on it. He was looking for a real city. But the city he was looking for, the architect and the builder, was God. Who built the new Yerushalayim? God. Who built earthly Jerusalem? Earthly people. Who built, yeah, the, the, the earthly, the earthly, all the, the, who built San Bernardino? Who built the <coughs> island? Earthly people build earthly cities. We read of God building one city, the new Jerusalem. He told Abraham, you're going to be a citizen of the new. You're going to be the citizen of the city I've made for you. Remember, God showed Abraham through the stars. He saw it all. He saw Yeshua coming. He saw Yeshua's death, burial, resurrection. He believed in it for the salvation of the soul because he was not saved by believing that he was going to have lots of grandkids that will never save anyone. But he saved him was his faith in Yeshua. He saw that day coming. I believe God showed him all the way through because we know the gospel and the stars goes all the way through everything that I've been telling you about, all the way through to the tribulation. It shows in the gospel and the stars the coming back of Messiah to rule and reign. It shows the time of the millennial kingdom, and it takes you right to that edge of the new Jerusalem. And that's where that gospel ends. That's why I think the new heavens may have a whole new map. Who knows? It could have something totally different, too. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, so, and, and I think it's important to remember this and to realize that this is the only city that God built and what he is calling us all to. Remember all the way back, go back to Revelation 21 and go all the way back to verse 2 where we were um, a couple classes ago and we were reminded, I saw the holy city, Yerushalayim, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. That's what we're getting, all that description now. So keep that in mind. That's our reference as we come on back down now to, I think we're ready for verse 13. Notice in this city how many twelves. Remember, administrative completeness, a, a perfect government, a perfectly run city. You know, there is order in heaven also. And again, anything that's down here is patterned after. And we know that even when it talks about the, the negative, when it talks about Satan, that how he has principalities and powers in high places. We know scripture tells us about archangels that are over angels. There's an order, there's an orderliness, there's a government, there's an administrative um, system. 
in heaven also. Nothing that's confining, but what allows everything to run freely, to run smoothly, I mean, to not be chaotic and crazy. You know, God is a God of order. His order is beautiful. There's Amen. nothing wrong with order, and there's everything wrong with chaos. So <laughs> here is God's order. So we see that in the 12s. We're going to see, we've already seen 12 gates and 12 angels and 12 tribes. We're going to see 12 foundations and 12 apostles. We're going to see 12 pearls, and we're going to see 12 kinds of fruit. We get an idea behind this. God's pointing us to perfect administrative completeness. God is in control. This control, this is his perfect city of administration, and it's for the eternal world. And I believe it's what God would have done through Adam. He would have organized through him, and it would have been a perfect city here on earth, so to speak. The whole earth would have been. But it didn't go the way God wanted it to. I mean, he knew. It wasn't a surprise. He didn't, oh no, what did my people do? <laughs> Let me come up with one of me. <laughs> that God in his love ordained the better for us. I think we need to take the air up, Roger. <laughs> Thank you. So verse 13 now. I want to keep us moving. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. <coughs> okay, we have four sides. Four shows us universality, north, south, east, west, all the way around. Three shows us again that divine government, because three reminds us of Trinity, triunity, the triunity of God. Four in scripture often speaks to us of earth. So if you take the four for earth and you take the three for the triune God who rules the earth, I believe that's what we're seeing in the picture of maybe why there's 12, because it's God's way of breaking that down. We see that when Israel encamped around the tabernacle, that they encamped also three tribes, three tribes, three tribes, and three tribes all the way around, north, south, east, and west. That also indicates the freedom to go in and out from all the areas. So all 12 gates, as it's already been said by Judy, are open, free for coming in and going out. We're not confined, we're not in prison, although what a gorgeous prison it would be, <laughs> but we're not confined. Because God's going to send us out. We're going to go do different things for him. We're going to go explore. We're going to go and try. Who knows what all we're going to do? Verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Okay. The Greek tells us very clearly that each was a foundation stone, and if you've ever done a house, you've ever built a house, you build a foundation, and then you build on the house. Well, there's going to be 12 foundations, okay? That's a lot. We're going to get into the size and all that in a bit. Each of those foundations was given to, to be like a stone. Remember, like the walls are like jasper. Each foundation is going to be like a stone, and they're each going to have the name of one of the apostles now. Okay, so we've got our apostles coming in. Now, the bride of Messiah, the church, the called out assembly, is then seen as being built on the foundation of both the apostles and the prophets, you know, and the tribes, because we see, you know, the tribes around also. Remember, this is the bride's <coughs> city. This is our, the city built for us. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. And we read, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the Father. Citizens, that's talking heaven. Um, lost my place. Okay, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but your fellow citizens with the saints. <coughs> Sorry, I told you with the Father, but that's true too. Okay, fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. So we're all fellows <coughs> together. We make a part of God's household. That's what it's saying. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Messiah Yeshua, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Remember, the whole foundation, or the whole building, I'm sorry, leans on the, the, the cornerstone. And we know the cornerstone was Yeshua. That was made very clear in um, Yeshua, Isaiah 28, 16, um, Psalm 118, verse 22 to 24, uh, 2 Peter, 1 Peter, oh my goodness, come on, Rochelle. It's in, it's in one of Peter's books. Um, I'll, I'll give you the scripture next week, but we've gone through it before. Pass over time, we go through it, and we see the fulfillment in it, that 
uh, when we see the cornerstone, we know it is speaking very clearly that it is Messiah. It is Yeshua, Jesus himself, and the whole building rested on that. It's what pulled it all together. It was what made it strong. Okay? This sounds like a house. Yes. The house Good. of the Lord. Good. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And 21, and who the whole building being fitted together, the whole thing fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. But what were we told in Hebrews? Well, I like what Patty just said, that there was the better house. The house was built by Yeshua. Moshe built a house, but this is the one who was over the house, Yeshua. He wasn't just, you know, Moshe built an earthly house. Yeshua was over the house, and he's building up a new house, a living house, because it's a house built of living stones. Remember how it's living stones? That's <laughs> you and I. When you came into saving faith, in essence, it was like your your brick was put in a place with your name on it. No, that's not exactly kosher, but you know what I'm trying to say. And it's where we see Jew and Gentile coming together. We have one house, one people, one new man, no middle wall partition, no, oh, Gentiles, you can only go this far. No, everyone comes in. How's that door open? Who is the door? Yeshua's the door. So yes, it's like a house or in this case, he's still calling it the holy temple um, in the Lord. Because that's who we are. We're, we're the temple of the, the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. He dwells us, that we know. It is that dwelling, that sukkah, that um, coming together in that intimate relationship that we're seeing. So, yes, very much so. And we know that uh, the foundations, the maker, was God himself. We read that in Hebrews 11 just a few moments ago. So, uh, we, what we're seeing, wow. Let's look at some of those foundations. Let's keep going and see what we're going to find out in <laughs> Revelation 21. And I think we're ready for verse 15. I'll look at 14. Did we do it all? And the wall. Um, yes. Okay. The only thing I didn't say, the wall of the city had the 12 foundation stones on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, of Yeshua and Jesus. They were his family that, that it's being referred to there. So now, verse 15, the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. Okay? Gold measuring rod. It's a golden reed that's used to measure. That's in keeping with the dignity and the service of God to see it in gold. When the temple was measured earlier in Revelation chapter 11 by the angel that was measuring it then, and that's when it talked about leave out a certain area because it's going to be trampled underfoot, etc., etc. It wasn't measured with a golden rod. It was just measured with a rod by that angel. This is measured by a golden rod. Golden in scripture speaks of deity. So this is keeping with the fact that we're measuring a divine city. We're measuring what belongs to God. It's perfect measure. It's not going to be off in any way. So let's look at how it is measured. And here's where my little... Um, Object lesson, I think, will help us. Okay, uh, gold rod to measure the city, to measure its gates and its wall. The whole thing is going to be measured. God's very, again, specific, orderly, and, and exacting. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as the width, and he measured the city with the rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. You may have in your scripture, if you're in King James still, it's four square. Okay, a square city is showing in that when you look at a square, a square is to be a picture of absolute perfection. It's the same on all four sides. You can turn and turn and turn and turn. A rectangle is not, but a square is that perfect, um, absolute perfection. <coughs> if you have old King James, you have 12,000 furlongs. Well, I already told you from mine because it gives the newer 1,500 miles. Okay, 1,500 square miles because we're square. You know, the length, the height, and the breadth is all the same. 1,500 square miles, if we were just going across, would reach from Maine to Florida. Okay, and from the Atlantic seaboard to 600 miles west of the Mississippi River. In other words, it's larger than half of the United States. That's a big city. That's a big area, okay? But we still have to look at the fact it's length and breadth and height. 
And that's where, with those all being equal, some said a cube, a cube mm -hmm. works, that an easier way to see is a pyramid. And here is where we begin to see. Now, in every direction, it would have to be equal, okay? So, and whether you can see that on this or not, it, it's, it's hard. Nothing's going to, to really be able to tangibly show us because we're earthly, okay? But this is like a huge skyscraper with immeasurable floors. You know, we tell me how many floors are in the tallest building in the United States. I don't even remember, but, you know, 121, whatever you want. This is going to be more than that because, remember, we've got 12 foundations. We've got it going up 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles in its depth. If it's a cube, I'm told that it would mean 2,250,000 square miles on each tier of the cube, extending 1,500 miles up. So as it went 1,500 miles up, it'd have to go out that 2,250,000 square miles in totality to get every tier that's 1,500 miles height, length, breadth. Are you beginning to see why I said let your mind soar? <laughs> Don't try to limit it because you can't get it. And here, of course, are the colors. We're going to talk about that. Here's our pearls at, at our 12 gates around it, the gold showing the deity. But again, just an example, but I, I think a good example to begin to give us an idea. And we saw that on our little chart, and we had a big chart up too that I told Roger we didn't need today. <laughs> we saw it in that form here also. Does that mean that we're absolutely right that's the way it is? No. But there's a good idea it could be like that. Again, Cubed may work better in your mind, especially if you're good in math and you can look at that cube and see it in its dimensions when it looks flat on paper, but you see it in 3D, <coughs> and then fine, you can use the cube idea. What's interesting is that the Holy of Holies, where God's presence dwelt in the tabernacle and the temple, was also a perfect cube in its measurements and in its shape, and God's presence dwelt there also. Are you getting an idea everything has to be perfect because God is there? His touch on it is just, God is perfect. He is perfection. So everything around him is perfection. Verse 17, and he measured its wall, 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. Okay, 72 yards, you may have 144 cubits. A cubit is 18 inches. So when you do 18 inches times this, this 144, the 72 yards, it's 216 feet high or long or thick. One continuous wall, 216 uh, feet high or length or thickness, whichever direction you're looking at it. Wow. Do I get it? No, I don't get it. I'm told it's a measure of a man by man's measurements from his elbow to his hand. That was the, the way they bought that, the cubit, the measurement. Yeah. It's the human standard, but it says of the angel. So the angel used the human measurement to give us an idea, to just help us <laughs> try to catch it. <laughs> well, the angels took on the appearance of men. I'm going to say it probably was an angel that was more like a man's size than a, than a huge or a small. Because again, by man's measurements and the angel using that human standard. I'm trying to find it because I know I'm going to have to quit somewhere in here. Um, Okay. While you're doing that, I'm kind of trying to imagine that it would be smaller than our, our Earth. Yes, it's smaller than the Earth, but it's but still, it's, yeah. it's got height that our Earth doesn't have. You know, we're not on 12 foundations. And we can't live in its depth. We live on the, basically on the outside, the circumference. Right. This, the, this, it can live all the way in, up, out. Mm -hmm. What did I miss one? What did I miss? I was told that it was like two moons. Yeah. Like two moons? Interesting. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Well, let's go just a little bit further. The building, verse 18, the material of all was jasper. We already looked at that. Um, 
remember the wall of Jasper denotes the glory of God and the light of God and it reflects that light to the earth that we looked at all those verses. In the Hebrew, the meaning can be polished. Um, the root meaning is to polish. When you polish a gem, it, it, you bring out its beauty. It's, it's to make it glitter all the more. You could use the word glitter if you want. So a character of the New Jerusalem, what we're seeing is that it's most precious, clear as crystal. And um, if you had to do like an emblem, it would be emblematic of God himself, of his glory and his beauty. That's why it had to be polished to perfection, to just shine the most brilliant that it could possibly shine. And that brings us again to the glory of God, which we know from Revelation 4.3 and from Hebrews 1.3 also. So again, we see the idea of brilliance, of that transparent light that, that radiates, of that light that just goes out. I mean, all of this is in here. The, um, Jasper was the last of the 12 stones inserted into the high priest's breastplate to save time since I'm watching the clock right now. Exodus 28 verse 20 and chapter 39 verse 13. It is on your pages of cross-references tell you about the, the stones that went into the breastplate. The first of the 12 used in the foundations of the New Jerusalem is in, um, is that 2119, the first one here? Yeah, we're gonna get the first one. Okay, so that's 2119. That the first of the 12 used in the foundation was Jasper, I mean the breastplate, the ephod, was Jasper, was this the same word is what I'm trying to say. And again, think of it like our diamond today. Um, and it, it's saying also the city was pure gold. Again, we've got gold being symbolic of, of beauty. So we've got a divine city here. Um, and it tells you that it was likened to um, clear glass, okay? Gold in appearance, but clear glass in substance. So what we're seeing is that the transparency indicates that it can transmit the glory of God in the form of light without any hesitation. It's like it's just allowed to flow, just to go. The glory of God just penetrating and going all the way through. Yes. Um, if you take a sheet of gold and you pound it out, it becomes completely transparent, but still uh, magnifies light because that's what they use on satellites. Okay, very interesting. And yet here we even have it in its depth that it keeps that clear, that transparency, that glow. Very interesting, thank you. Yes, okay, verse 19, we'll go just a, a tiny bit more. Verse 19, the foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. Okay, we've got 12 layers. Each one's going to be a spectacular gem. That's what we're going to see. Um, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say. Okay, I mean the precious stones, yeah, okay, okay. So the light is shown through the apostles because we got verse 14, the wall of the city uh, had the 12 foundation stones on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles. So remember, we're carrying that out. It's like each apostle has one, one color, one, one foundation, one level, okay? Um, remember the breastplate, of, I'm hurrying, I'll, I'll hit the highlights of this again next week. But the breastplate that had the 12 stones was representing the 12 tribes. So again, we see the 12 apostles, we see the 12 tribes. Um, and what we see when you go from the stones, the first is red, the sardius, the last is, the last is the jasper. I'm sorry, I think I said the first earlier, but the last is the jasper in the breastplate of the high priest. We see that when we go through, it gives us all the colors of the rainbow. When you move from the red of the shed blood, you come all the way through to the pure which is what we become when we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. And we know that the rainbow is, is reflecting or refracting of God's glory, um, giving all the colors, and all those colors are meaningful in our salvation story. We know it's the um, redemptive arch in never-ending blessings of wonder, R-A-I-N-B-O-W, that we see in that um, when the, our astronauts get farther out in outer space where they're away from the light, then they don't see all the colors. Most everything out there is gray and black. Remember we hear about the black holes? Mm -hmm. But remember God is the light. The light's not being stopped. The light is flowing freely and completely. And because 
I say God, but I'll say Yeshua now, because Yeshua is the light. It's like he's the light and the power company. <laughs> You're not going to have any darkness. You're going to be seeing all of the colors continually, never ending, never ending. That, that's what begins to blow me, my mind. Um, I want to read to you because I, I, I teased you. We're just going to pack up fast and go fast when we go, okay? Give me, give me just a couple more minutes because it's right here. The colors of the stones, let me just go through them quickly. This is verses 19 and 20. Jasper was used for stones of various colors back then, or diamonds today. <coughs> Sapphire was blue, but hard like the diamond. Um, Chalcedony, if I'm saying it wrong, forgive me, would be sky blue, but it would also... Um, it will also have stripes of other colors in it, so like sky blue and then other colors running through it. Emerald was bright green. Sardonyx was red and white. Sardius was reddish. Chrysolite, golden yellow in transparency, different from the modern stone today that's called chrysolite. Beryl <coughs> was sea green, S-E-A, sea green, like an emerald. Um, topaz was yellow green and transparent. Christophrasis, I don't know, Christophrase, phrase, I don't know, gold and green, Jason, violet, and amethyst, purple, or rose, red. These colors don't do it justice here. But each color, and see them in their vibrancy, in their polish, in reflecting the glory of the Lord, wow. And we see again the whole spectrum of God's colors in this. It's amazing. Now, a gemologist in Southern California, I don't know who, the, my source did not name, but a gemologist was asked to analyze the city and its gems. I love what he said. His reply, the sight of this city would be beyond our human eyes to capture. We cannot, in our human eyes, contain this glory. We'll look next week at the 12 gates being 12 pearls. We'll have fun with that. But let me read you because I want your mind to, to just keep going and keep going and keep going. This is a great place to, um, to uh, oh, I don't know if I told you all, but if I didn't tell you all that, I'll give you that next week too. Uh, this is a great place for our mind to be able to stop and to just think on this. And if I didn't bring it, oh, here it is, here it is. Okay, we're seeing the brilliance, we're seeing the beauty. And we're, we're thinking, okay, I'm getting a handle on this. Well, mm -hmm. tell me if you're getting a handle on it afterward. Let me tell you, and I'm doing this in honor of dear beloved Pastor Fred, <laughs> who loved astronomy, studied it, and loved to blow our minds astronomically. And um, it's very close to his birthday. So happy birthday, Pastor Fred. He's in heaven. Um, he told us about Beetlejuice. He kept telling me, go look at Beetlejuice, Rochelle. Go look it up. It's not the movie Beetlejuice. That's B-E-E-T-L-E-J-U-I-C-E. -E -E. No, this is B-E-T-E-L-G-E-U-S-E. -E -E. Okay, this is sounds the same, but it's totally different. He kept saying, you gotta go, you just gotta go read about this one star, just this one star. Now remember our new Yerushalayim is greater than this, okay? Open up your minds. That's the eighth brightest star in the night sky and the second brightest star that makes up the constellation of Orion. This star's diameter is roughly 2,000 times that of our sun's and 155,000 times that of the Earth's. Wow. Now, V.Y. Canis Majoris is a hypergiant star located 3,900 light years from Earth. This is where you find Beetlejuice. It's one of the largest stars known. In the millimeter continuum, the star is around 1,400 times larger than the sun. I just read that. The overlaid annotation shows how large the star is compared to the solar system. Beetlejuice would engulf all four terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, and even the gas giant Jupiter. Only Saturn would be beyond its surface. Tucked within our cozy solar system of planets and moons and comets and more, the sun is a colossal blinding ball of burning light. It contains 99.86% of the mass in our solar system and is large enough to fit 1.3 million Earths inside of it. Pretty big, right? Well, while the sun might dwarf the Earth, in reality, it's minuscule compared to some of the largest stars in our home galaxy in the Milky Way. 
The most massive star within 10,000 light years from Earth is the largest star of a two star system called Eta Carinae. I don't know how to say it. This star is 90 times the mass of our sun and shines 5 million times brighter. It appears blue to the naked eye because its surface temperature is six times hotter than our sun. Okay. Even larger than the Eta Carinae, how do you say, is a star 640 light years from Earth called Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse, again, the eighth brightest star in the night sky. Again, on a clear night, you can easily see it with your naked eye. So I've probably seen it. No, no. <laughs> Astronomers estimate Betelgeuse is 300 times larger than Eta Carinae that I just described. If you replaced our sun with Betelgeuse, the star would swallow the planets. I didn't realize this was so repetitive. Sorry, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are reaching out to the orbit of Jupiter. Of course, the best way to feel really, really super small is to compare our sun to one of the largest stars ever observed. That VY Canis that I started with, the star's diameter roughly 2,000 times that of our sun's, 155,000 times that of our Earth. Again, it's repeating. I apologize. Um, okay, I'm trying to see where it's not repeating. Maybe that's it. Once they've exhausted their fuel supply, hypergiants explode in a glorious burst of light called a supernova. These explosions are what seed the universe with heavy elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen essential for life on Earth. If the star is massive enough before exploding, it forms a black hole. So when you begin to see that, when you see how big Betelgeuse is, how amazing that is, and we know the new rich lion being the glory of God is even greater. Do we have an awesome God? Is yep. his creation not amazing? Are we not absolutely mind boggled? You know, I mean, we just, I tell the Lord, take the lid off. Just take the lid off. Or the Lord. Let it go. And I want to leave you on that note. That's our God. And again, when you see that, when you know that, when you hear that, when you know that that sun, is just right in our space to warm us and not fry us or not too far so that we freeze when you know that everything's kept in its orbit when you know that these planets or these uh, supernovas i'm sorry give off the elements we need to breathe when you see that just one of them exploding is one of those black holes and science can't even figure what's in that black hole then i'm going to leave you with this whatever problem you have Remember, but God, that's what we have. So, do we have a glorious future? Yes. Can we hardly wait? Yes. I didn't even get to tell you about the pearls yet. <laughs> it will continue on in this glory when we come back next week. But in the meantime, just feast on how great your God is, how big your God is. And let it miniaturize whatever problem you're facing. Because it does kind of put it in perspective, doesn't it? But then at the same time, when I realize that means I am a speck of dust in the middle of this universe, which is in the middle of how many more universes and how many more galaxies and how many more whatevers that we don't know to name. And then I know that God knows, and every hair is on my head today, God heard my prayers today. God works in the detail, moment by moment, of my life today. And when he works in my life, he has to work in all those other lives that are interacting so that whatever has to be happening just happens to fall into the right measure of time and space. Yeah, that minimizes my problems. And yes, that grows my God, and it blows my mind. And all I can say is, Lord, take us home. We want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, yes, Patty. It really does show that God really wants the best for us. Yes. Heaven yes. is not second best. It is not the B list. It is best. 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 best of the best. best. The same way Hebrews, everything was better, 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 better. The better is yet to come. And it amazes me that he chose me and he loves me. And he chose you 
any last year. So, go in that love. Go in that love. Bask in it. Let your mind just. Oh, wait. Yes. Yeah. And, and just ask the Lord to give you a, a sneak peek. I'm asking. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord God, we praise you. You are on your throne, victorious, risen, alive, powerful, magnanimous, mind-blowing creator. Oh my God, I can't even begin to say what you are. All of these words, and I feel like I didn't even do you justice. Lord, we thank you. We're humbled that you care about a mere speck, that you care enough to love us, that you loved us in our sin state, that you died for us, that you left heaven. You left the glories that we're talking about to come to this sin soaked earth. Oh, God, how can we ever say thank you? Lord, all we can do is humble ourselves before you and say, take me on yours, do as you want with me. And this week, Lord, take us, use us to your glory. Let people see your glory because you worked through us in that way. Show us the heavens of our home, Lord. Give us a sneak peek of where we're going to be with you forever. And Lord, thank you for the joy set before us to enable us to endure. These hardships are smaller right now, Lord, but when they grow big again, remind us of how big you are and how great our future is. Thank you for the precious, the sure, true word of God. We know that we know that we know, and the best part of it, Lord, is we'll be in your light, in your glory, face to face with you forever. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord God, thank you. Okay. Amen. Amen. As they say, so with God, that I'm in the way.